Hello, welcome to the program since 2014. Illegal annexation of Crimea, blatant human rights violations are committed on a daily basis by the de facto Russian authorities, Crimean Tatars, Ukraine's supporters or simply outspoken critics of the Russian regime. The list of the victims of such abuse keeps increasing. Now, economic sanctions against Russia have been implemented to push pressure on the regime after the annexation. Recently, Deputy Justice Minister of, of Ukraine, Sergei Petuchov, suggested to use, quote, personal sanctions. Now, he is here today in our studio to talk more about this topic, among others. Thanks you for joining us. Uh, so, can you expand, can you explain the, this idea of mm -hmm. uh, personal sanctions? Now, personal sanctions for the violation of human rights is a common instrument used to influence the decision makers or politicians who are involved in a gross violation of human rights. This has happened throughout the world, but specifically with respect to Russia, the Magnitsky list, the, the, the act of Congress that was adopted is quite famous. And this has been replicated in other countries, in Canada, in Baltic countries. And also the EU has also introduced personal sanctions as a result of annexation of Crimea. But we now want to shift the focus. So one thing is the annexation that happened in 2014. There are people who are responsible for it. But then, since then, for the four years, we've seen people increasingly involved in suppressing the population of Crimea, in violating the human rights, in torturing people, in detaining them illegally and sentencing them to the real prison uh, terms for just having an alternative political opinion. So we think that having a personal sanctions uh, by Ukraine and other countries in the world against those people would send a powerful message to the illegal authorities in Crimea and also to the to Kremlin that people who are involved in these activities will not be tolerated and will not be able to sort of travel freely or have assets abroad and might be detained whenever so, they leave Russia. Which uh, brings me to the tools. How how does it work? Which what, what are the consequences of, of such sanctions? So this can take different forms, uh, what we understand under personal sanctions. This can be the ban on entry in a specific country, cancellation of visa, uh, asset freeze is something that is quite general. And also this, of course, uh, limits the possibility of these per people to have bank accounts or get involved in any financial transactions. On the Ukrainian side, I mean, uh, the people that we are talking about, uh, these are the so-called judges, prosecutors, security service officers in Crimea who've been prosecuting our nationals. So on our side, of course, we are starting and investigating the criminal cases against them based on the evidence that we can collect. However, other countries can support Ukraine and uh, bring attention to what's happening in Crimea by introducing personal sanctions against those people. Now, um, I get the tool, but what is the real efficiency of the leverage? Because sanctions have been applied against the Russian regime uh, after the annexation of Crimea. We talked about mm -hmm. uh, the Magnitsky Act. <clears throat> and, well, uh, Russia is, has still, uh, is still in, in Crimea. And, and how, how can Ukraine, I mean, with potentially mm -hmm. not really manpower and not really leverage, can, you know, apply these sanctions? Look, sanctions don't work overnight. They have a long-lasting effect and what we see now with the new act of Congress that was uh, adopted, introducing sanction against the so-called Kremlin list, the people who are close to Kremlin and owe all of their fortune due to the, due to the political influence that, uh, that they have, is something that really works that has sent a powerful shock throughout the Russian society because people, uh, you know, the rich people who actually run the country understood that their actions can be revealed, their ties with the West can be cut. And uh, in fact, I mean, they, all of the assets they have or the safe havens they use are somewhere in Europe or other Western European countries. So we think that this kind of sanctions are uh, are working, they are undermining the ability and willingness of these, you know, top people to follow the Russian politics. They influence within their small circle of friends around Kremlin. They influence the dynamics of decision making. And they also uh, send a bigger signal to the whole of the world that the people who are involved either in money laundering or furthering political uh, 
you know, political deeds of Kremlin or violation of human rights would not be tolerated, would not be able to get a citizenship in another country, get a house, uh, get a, you know, bank accounts with the money they, that they can explain, etc. Um, if I may say, I do have a counterexample with, with, with this uh, sanction. Boris Rottenberg, the famous Boris Rottenberg, mm -hmm. still has millions in the French Riviera. His assets hasn't been frozen and he's still able, like a lot of oligarchs, mm -hmm. uh, to come in the West for mm -hmm. leisure, most, most of it. So m what, 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 what I, what I want to go here is, as Ukraine is proposing these personal mm -hmm. sanctions, if I understand, wouldn't it work better? And which country do you expect to follow that kind of sanction and how to apply them so uh, they're completely efficient in that you know, business really complete tie, c mm -hmm. cut ties with the oligarchs and things like that. Yes. So uh, when we're talking about Crimea sanctions uh, for the violation of human rights, uh, we're mostly talking about this issue with our partners in the European Union. And European Union as an organization can impose sanctions on people who are involved in cross violation of human rights. And, when, and we think that that's important because that represents, you know, the places where these people would most probably want to go or have any connection to. And that also forms the public opinion in the European countries, because in this way we bring attention to the uh, things these people have done in Crimea to the European agenda. True. <clears throat> There has been doubts recently um, uh, towards um, citizens like Gerhard uh, Mr. Schroeder, for example, mm -hmm. who is uh, kind of playing a double game towards Nord mm -hmm. Stream. Um, what about insisting on these people especially, because the, these are the leverage with big entities? Mm -hmm. Well, um I, I wouldn't comment on a specific issue, but of course there is always a question of conflict of interest. We've seen some of the European politicians uh, shortly after retirement would be uh, serving in this or other capacity in, in Russia. But I think this is a this is a sort of all European discussion that has to follow. And that not only concerns Russia, it's the matter of conflict of interest, how the decision makers can change ranks and what are the rules that should regulate that. Uh, but what we want to emphasize and bring uh, attention to of our European counterparts is that Russian politics is toxic and the Russian oligarchs are toxic and the people who make decisions today in Russia are toxic because they are responsible for the annexation of Crimea, gross violation of human rights, violation of public international law. This, can hap this happened in Ukraine, this happened in Georgia, this happened in Moldova. So. We want to uh, make clear to everyone that the whole Russian political elite is toxic and having any relation with them outside of official capacity would adversely influence the reputation of anyone who would do that. And that would so make soil people... the reputation of the people of dealing course. with it. So that would make people think twice whether to take Russian money for representing them serving as a face of Russian, uh, Russian business or Russian government. Now, um, I want to switch to a smaller and maybe another topic just for, for one moment. You are the Deputy Justice Minister on European integration, so you deal with Europe mm -hmm. and Western partners. Uh, there has been a, recently the case of the mayor of, of, of Odessa, Mr. Trukhanov, who has been bailed out by, uh, by Ukrainian MPs. What kind of message does it send? Of course, and I completely. Um, I completely understand your message of this Russian system being mm -hmm. toxic, but in that that kind of case, that kind of mediatic case, what kind of message does that send to the Western partners that Ukraine wants to work with? I think it's a, it sends a very clear signal that uh, no one in Ukraine, whatever his or her position might be, is immune from uh, prosecution in case of serious doubts of corruption on his part. So uh, I, I think that the National Anti-Corruption Bureau that is investigating this case is actually on track and hopefully they are professional enough to show enough evidence uh, that, would, uh, that would support their case of investigating uh, Mayor of Odessa. And if not, he should be freed. And I think, again, this is a good signal uh, that we're sending that no one can escape uh, justice in this country. And that's something that has never been here before. Even if he has been vouched by for and released on parole, I mean, that's kind of a contradictory 
uh, uh, well, again, message, I mean, yeah. uh, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know the specifics of this case. I don't know what were the reason that the judge could have taken to let him on parole. But I think that, again, uh, the signal is clear that no one has immunity. We haven't seen high-ranking officials being even investigated or any uh, information about their corruption deals uh, coming to surface and somebody looking at them seriously. There has been a uh, certain procrastination in these high profile cases. That's why we're talking about the establishment of the anti-corruption court, another entity that would be specifically dealing with this high profile corruption cases. But we see that uh, the newly established anti-corruption bureau that is investigating the top corruption cases has been active, has been providing specific evidence, has, has uh, earned the public support and trust. And I think, again, that sends a good signal that Ukraine is on track in fighting high-level corruption. And uh, so, and, and to, uh, to, conclude, uh, to conclude, so that plus the personal sanctions, as you were, were talking about, uh, might help, do you think, restore uh, the trust that the West uh, will have in Ukraine? Because there's a risk there, there's a risk, and there are the words that there might be a Ukrainian fatigue with, as you said, the procrastination. With the high ranking. Uh, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, the matter of Crimea is not really a Ukrainian matter. So whatever, even if there'd be ever Ukrainian fatigue, Crimea is uh, a global problem because we haven't seen uh, an occupation and annexation of part of a European country by another country since, since the Second World yeah. War. So this issue is on a different level. Uh, and uh, whatever the response the international community can come up with in respect to this flagrant violation of international law by a permanent member of Security Council will define how the world will develop and how the security is going to look like, you know, in the coming years. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to have you uh, in the studio. Uh, this was Sergei Petrov, Deputy Justice Minister of Ukraine on European Integration. Thank you for watching the program. Stay tuned for the rest.